In five minutes, we'll release you to sit down. Please, a round of applause for the... Reverend Isaac Kwesi Akwa, I'm tempted to call you Honorable Member because of where you're sitting. A few house rules, I encourage all to please turn off their phones. If you can place them on silent, it will be greatly appreciated. At the same time, the restrooms are located outside. If you need any assistance, deck on any of the ushers and they'll be glad to assist you in that regard. My name is Ajololo. Guess what? It means a big blessing or a big reward. And through time, and perfect circumstance, I believe it has fallen to me to declare the biggest blessing that we can ever receive today. Are you ready for it? Oh, come on. It is the man, the myth,
the legend reborn. It is the making of the diplomatist Alex Kwesin Saki. Put your hands together. <laughs> this great body of work to bring back the ideals of our father through his memoirs, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Council of Foreign Relations Ghana, together with the family of our late father. And I just pray that today we shall leave here with a deep appreciation of what Ghana has done and continues to do in the area of foreign relations. And as we hear from this man who lived his life to the glory of God and to the admiration of all men, we shall be also compelled to do more and leave behind a legacy worth telling many generations. This afternoon, I acknowledge with gratitude members of the Council of Foreign Relations who join us. Allow me to make welcome the President, Ambassador D.K. Osei. In his company is the Vice President, Ambassador Cabral Blay Amelia. We're joined by a member of the Council, Ambassador Dr. William G.M. Branfo, our book reviewer. Thank you very much. With great delight, we receive in our midst, ladies and gentlemen, the chairperson of the ECOWAS Trade Liberalization Scheme Task Force and working on the Abidjan Lagos Corridor to, move, to remove those barriers. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas. Thank you very much. We receive representing our father, ladies and gentlemen, his two wonderful children, Madame Awu Kwesin Saki and Nenye Kwesin Saki. <laughs> Together with a host of you, excellencies, members of the diplomatic corps, and Ghanaian diplomats who have served and continue to serve with distinction, please accept the warm and generous recognition of this house. And look through our program, please, a round of applause for them. A look through our program reveals a very engaging lineup, but I can promise you that, like our father, everything will proceed on time, on point, and on message. We shall begin now by acknowledging the chairperson for this occasion. A man, ladies and gentlemen, we all love and cherish, the president of the Council of Foreign Relations, Ghana. A retired diplomat ambassador, D.K. Osei consults with a number of African governments and international organizations in the area of conflict resolution, diplomatic negotiations, and mediation. In a career spanning several decades, he served at Paris, Corner Creek, in Shasta, Copenhagen, and was appointed ambassador at large in 2001. He also served in private capacity as the private secretary to the pri president of Ghana, I beg your pardon, His Excellency J.A. Kufour, from 2001 to 2009 and was a member of several strategic national bodies, such as the Cabinet, the Economic Management Team, the Advisory Council, and the National Security Council. He has, during his career, worked closely with two other former heads of state, President Hilary Mann and President Rawlings, as the diplomat in residence at the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. He taught several courses in its MA program, and for his distinguished work as a diplomat and role in several conflict resolutions on the continent, he has been recognized with several national honors. The Order of the Volta Companion Division, Ghana, Togo's highest national decoration, the Commander of the Order of Moyo, 2009, and the Order of Gravan Hay, 2008. From Her Royal Highness, the Queen of Netherlands, Ambassador Osei is a graduate of the University of Ghana, Legon, and a study at the Sheikh Hunter Diop Institute in Dakar and holds postgraduate degrees in international relations from the University of Ghana and l'Institut International d'Administration République Paris. If I got those wrong, please pardon me, I haven't had lunch. <laughs> it is with great pride and privilege, ladies and gentlemen, I give to you our chairperson for this day, the president of the Council of Foreign Relations Ghana, Ambassador D.K. Osei. Thank you. 
greatness of our Lord and Savior. The main ones are less pleasing. Second, the council has, as one of its flagship programs, the publication of memoirs and so they want to be encouraging. Can you hear me? Really? Okay. In moving on, we would like to have a statement from the daughter of a father whose untiring efforts have helped in compiling this book. Awoko Isinsaki is the third child of her father, Dr. Alex Isinsaki. She was in New York and observed at close quarters most of the events that have been catalogued in the book. She's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations Ghana and works as a human resource executive at a major corporation in Ghana. She is a sister, a mother, and grandmother. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my joy and pleasure to invite Awo Kwesin Saki. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to start in 1992. And don't worry, I'm not going to go through every year. So hopefully this will not be too long, but 
1992, my father was visiting his children in, uh, in the United States. And he spent some time with me, as he did with the others. We would sit outside on my patio and write. And then he asked me if I could type the handwritten pages for him. And I told him I couldn't. I didn't have the time to do that. I was busy with work and being a mother, et cetera. But I would find someone else to do it. So I did that. And we spent a fair amount of time going back and forth. He wasn't happy with the, with the person because they kept making mistakes. I wasn't happy because we had to go back and forth and I didn't have time for that either. So when he finished his visit and went back to Ghana, I was at work a few months later. Okay, a few months later, when I got a late night call to say that he had died after a short hospitalization. And some of you, family members, Tamba, Fofo Akwa, were at the funeral in January of 1993. I had parts of the manuscript, my brother Kebi had other parts of it, so I ended up with everything. And I started typing a few random chapters and publishing on LinkedIn. I didn't quite know what the concept was or what I was gonna do, but I didn't get very far. And then the COVID-19 pandemic happened, working from home, not being able to go anywhere. So I was determined to leave the pandemic better than when I entered the pandemic. So guess what I took on as a project? My father's autobiography. So I typed everything I actually worked uh, a lot of nights to get it done. And then my brothers proofed it uh, for me, KB and Nay proofread the chapters. And then the book abruptly ended because obviously he had died. And I wasn't sure what to do. I gave chapters to DK and then Nay suggested, hey, Cabral is willing to help. I don't know whether Cabral was actually willing or whether Nay <laughs> said that Cabral was willing, but he said Cabral is willing to help. So I called Cabral and next thing I knew, Cabral said, okay, and he came over to my place. We, Nay had sent me 300 pictures from you know, the, the life of my father. And Cabral said, well, this one will do, not this one, not this one, and we kind of went through pictures. And then somewhere along the way, my sister Yaba said, Empire had always said that you would publish the book. And I said, well, that's news to me. How did he know that I was gonna do it when I didn't think I was gonna do it? So I'm telling this story because at some point in the process, there was motivation and an unwillingness on my part for the story not to be told. He was a man who was really dedicated to his country from an early age and who was determined to be of service. That's one thing I learned when I typed the manuscript. I also learned about his background in mining when he was a young labor officer in the Western region. That's something that Prince Ankara has not let me forget uh, from the mining world. It reminds me from time to time. I learned in putting the book together what it took for African nations to fight for independence in the 1950s and 1960s against the resistance that was put up by the European countries. I admired the precision with which plans were made for Ghana's independence and the diplomatic corps and the first crew of ambassadors that were trained. It was precise, it was thorough, and it included everything, including foreign lang languages. And I felt a great deal of pride that Mpa was my father, we called him Mpa, was a participant in those processes, that he stood for something amongst Africans and people of African descent everywhere in the world. So that's one thing that I actually think that my brother's sister and I got from him. I remember in 1964, when he was appointed president of the General Assembly, and my fellow students in Achimota would laugh at me and refer to him jokingly as the king of the world. And I was informed too, I was 10 or 11 years old. So this book is a little bit like watching the movie Titanic. We kind of know how it ends. What we may not know and can learn from reading this book is how the story unfolds from the perspective of one participant and one observer. The young people who helped me research and edit the book both said that they didn't know much of what they read. They were not around and they hadn't learned it and they didn't know anything about it. So they learned a lot just in terms of the proofreading. And this slice of history, as Cabral calls it, is not in our history books. It's not chronicled anywhere. That the story is now available is something I'm grateful to a lot of people for. First of all, I don't know about you, but I thank God for every day. Umpa died at 68. 
and I'm turning 68 in a few weeks. I'm not suspicious or superstitious, so there's no link. I'm just letting you know, okay? You, don't, you can breathe easy. <laughs> Each day is a gift. I thank God for all the people who played a part in getting the book to today. I want to thank you for all attending and lending your support to this launch and to all who will purchase the book and make a, make a pledge. Thank you in advance. This book is not going to make any money, I promise you, but it wasn't meant to be a commercial venture. We want people to value what has gone before and the people who paid it forward for us and that we should do the same. So my partners, the Council of Foreign Relations Ghana, thank you for your sponsorship and your backing. In particular, just a pool of gratitude to Dike and Cabral, who were the early adopters, providing encouragement and more than support for me to complete the book and get it published. Cabral introduced, to, introduced me to Mr. Fred Labi and his DigiBooks team. I thank them for making sure that we did a good job with the finished product and with this event today. So thank you, Samuel, Elliot, Mr. and Mrs. Labi, and others on the team. Jeffrey Akowa Mankwa and Solomon Deborah gave up many Saturdays during the uh, 2020 to do the research, proofread, spell check. I'm not a pleasure to work with, I'll be honest. <laughs> but they stuck with it. They verified sources. Thank you both for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Koku Doche organized the pictures for me, did the final proofreading, created all the branding, the videos, the coffee table photo book, which will be here shortly for you to uh, flip through, all the visuals. Everything is Koku's work. So Accra Koku, I don't know if you're here yet, but thank you. I promise to let you win the next Scrabble game that we play. <laughs> and my siblings, what can I say about my siblings? What can I say about my siblings? Eje and Nana, who are not here, they died young and are missed every day. KB Nei and Yaba, who provide 100% support through thick and thin. They are my rock. My son, Awanate, who is everything and more. You guys are by heart and the folks that I live for. Joanna Wachi, my sister and friend. Oh my God, I've known her since I was 10. She took charge of the entire book launch. I said, Joanna, I need someone to do it. Oh, she'll do it. And she made it happen. Who does that for somebody except someone who loves? She worked with Cabral when I couldn't, worked with my cousin Aya as well, who unfortunately could not be here today, but who chipped in of her time and her energy and other resources. There are not enough words to thank you with. Thank you. Chambas, who has been around at key points along the way. <laughs> in France Supreme School with my brothers, Eje and Nana, attending Legon at the same time I was there, sitting in the row in front of me at Impa's funeral in January 1993, and then agreeing to be here today. I'm so honored, thank you. <laughs> My uh, cousin slash uncle Cole will be here soon, uh, Cole, so hopefully he'll be here. <laughs> he, thinks, he, think, he thought the thing started at five. So <laughs> we'll see whether he gets here, but he uh, did the forward for the book. And he told me many stories as he was uh, thinking about what he would write. And some of those stories end up in the forward. And there are other people who are here that I could mention. I just thank all of you. The Winneba Youth Choir, which for me is a Ghanaian institution. They're here to always support with song. Thank you. And they always sing my favorite one first, so thank you very much. <laughs> my work associates from Newmont, oh my God, they are so supportive. I am so grateful to have all of you here. Thank you so much for being here. It means a lot to me. And then lastly, my parents, Alex and Elsie, Aman and Pa, thank you. Thank you for the lives you led and the examples that you were. So on Sunday, this Sunday, at uh, Ebenezer Methodist Cathedral, we'll offer thanks. And I just want to say that the Kwezensaki family wraps all of this up all this gratitude, all these thanks, and we lift it up to God. And I want to shower everybody who's here with thanks and blessing. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. I believe that we fulfill the dream of my fathers today. So thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, the words are few, but I believe that hearts are bound with gratitude. Madam Awuku Isinsaki, thank you very much. Whenever I see you, I'm encouraged that my three daughters will end up 
as brilliant and as accomplished as you are. The only thing I fear is that some three boys will come and read from where they haven't soon. <laughs> Our father loved music, and for which reason, we're joined by the Winneba Youth Choir, who will serenade us to two of his favorite songs. A round of applause for them.
joining us through a recorded message, an original member of the G10. I'm talking about the first contingent of men who were commissioned into the foreign service under the Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Joining us now is Ambassador Richard Akwe. For the next few minutes, please lend him your ears. Ambassador Richard Okwey, we thank you ever so much. Thank and if it sounds like a World War II radio, please, it's because he's 99 years old. A round of applause. <laughs> to review this book is a man who, like her father, went to the Great Infant Spam, joining the Foreign Service in the year 1977. Ladies and gentlemen, his journey has seen him traverse several prestigious and cumulative, sorry, prestigious as well as progressively responsible roles. Some of the assignments he is undertaking have seen him as ambassador, at the same time to chief of protocol and supervising director of policy planning, research, and monitoring from November 2006 to October 2008. His journey has seen him through Mali, Ethiopia, Zambia, Benin, Kenya, Germany, to mention but a few. What is striking about his life story, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that he's also an author, and through his work, ladies and gentlemen, personal reflections of the Ghanaian Foreign Service Diplomacy, which was forwarded by the late His Excellency Dr. Kenneth Kawunda. He shares his experience as a practitioner and also those interested in the subject of African diplomacy generally have a source book to learn from. 
Today, it's my pride and joy to welcome, to review our book, Ambassador Bradford. A round of applause as he comes. Jerry, thanks for the very nice words of uh, introduction. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I wish to announce that today is 9th August, and to remind ourselves that if the late Ambassador Alex Kwezinsaki, affectionately called Mpa, meaning my father, if he were to be alive, he would have turned 98 years. In that connection, I humbly invite all of us to observe a minute's silence in his memory standing. And while doing so, to also remember those members of his immediate family who have since passed on, namely Auntie Elsie, Eja Akumbia and Nana Bodo. Thank you. Kindly resume your seats. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Today is an auspicious occasion because we are being afforded the opportunity in the words of the celebrated Methodist hymn number 896 to now praise we great and famous men. I think it is proper in this context to begin by thanking those who toiled to put together the book around which we are assembled today. Thank you, Ao Afriba, and your team, for editing and completing the manuscripts you inherited after the passing of Mpa on December 21st, 1992, and for arranging 30 years on for its launch. Ao and your team while commending you for your travails and for your perseverance, I wish to observe that you have produced an excellent piece of work, momentous in character, historic in detail, and which I'm sure will be corrected in subsequent reprints of the book. The middle name of the legendary first African headmaster of infantry school should be corrected to read Lodovic and not Lawrence, as captured at page 14. <laughs> Having thanked the producers of the book, it will be remiss on my part to omit to mention our own Kohansa for contributing the foreword in his own plain style of a filmmaker. On a personal note, I have to thank the Council on Foreign Relations Ghana generally and the key office holders in particular for agreeing to assign me to carry out this review Hopefully, by the end of this pleasurable exercise, we welcome you, <laughs> Koansa.
Hopefully, by the end of this pleasurable exercise, the audience would get to appreciate better why I willingly accepted my role as a reviewer. After all, my maternal roots are from Winneba. And just like Mpa of the lineage of the Tumpa Anana royal family. Clearly, this review is not about me, but I cannot help disclosing here and now that I belong to MOBA 1969, that Eja and Nana were my seniors by a year, and that Nehi Embiri and myself are Freemasons belonging both to Infants Film Lodge, consecrated on 4th April 1953 as the premier school lodge within the English constitution in Ghana, and to Orbis Lodge, a fraternity of past and current members of the diplomatic community of Ghana. At the consecration of Orbis Lodge on 8th December 1989, the late Ambassador Kwesin Saki served as the founding, as the founding immediate past master, together with such diplomatic stalwarts as the late Ambassador Henry Van Hinsechi, the late Ambassador Vishnu Kofi Wasiamal, and the late KB Asante, among others. Kindly keep these linkages and connections in mind as I share one event that took place on 4th July 2018 in the spirit of us now praising we great and famous men. On that day, Jubilee House, with the personal involvement of His Excellency the President of the Republic, graciously endorsed the package put together to honor the group of 10 pioneer officers at an awards ceremony at which the late Ambassador Alexander Kwesinsaki and his distinguished peers were honored. Eight posthumously, while two, namely Ambassador Richard Maximilian Akwe and Ambassador Ebenezer Moses Deborah were recognized as the only two of our forebears still alive. Awu and her team have further elaborated on this memorable event in the postlude to these memoirs. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my observations so far are meant to paint a certain background for us to place the makings of a diplomatist in the proper context of the belated attempts to celebrate the achievements of foreign service officers present and past who have documented their career experiences for posterity. While we wait with bated breath for the announced launching of the book by Ambassador Kwame Asamoah Tinkran about his stewardship as Director of State Protocol, which coincided with the presidency of the late Professor John Van Sata Mills, I have much pleasure in commending, among others, Ambassador Daniel Kufuosei for the publication of his Privileged Conversations, <laughs> Adventures of an African Diplomat. Ambassador Harold Ajeman for his treatment of diplomatic protocol, a guide for Ghanaian diplomats and senior government officials. Ambassador Kobna Osei Dankwa for his breaking down diplomacy, an insider's guide to the art of negotiation. Ambassador Branfo for his personal reflections of a Ghanaian foreign service officer with a Ghanaian diplomacy, and Mr. Joseph Akwe Alote for a plethora of publications, including a memoir 
of a pragmatic Ghanaian diplomat. The late Ambassador Sam Kwam blazed the trail in his day with his publication of Diplomatic Offensive that sought to glorify Ghana's days in the golden age of her diplomacy. To these works by current and former foreign service officers should be added the opus magnum by former foreign minister, His Excellency Dr. Obediawa Samwa, entitled The Political History of Ghana, The Experience of a Nonconformist. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, individually and collectively, the books I have referred to all contain relevant information about the makings of a diplomatist. However, the volume that we are privileged to review on this occasion has a rare vintage and is closed with on. Ultimately, we may also ask for the explanation in respect of how a diplomatist is made. In the attempt to answer that question, we are led willingly to our book and the review, The Makings of a Diplomatist. In our endeavor to respond to the question, the notorious contribution from Sir de Calier's book, De la manière de négocier avec le souverain, otherwise explained as on the manner of negotiating with princes. princes. First published in 1716, which in the words of that famous English diplomat Harold Nicholson, remains to this day the best manual of diplomatic care, found from pages 126 to 127 as follows. Quote, the good diplomatist must have an observant mind, a gift of application which rejects being diverted by pleasures of frivolous amusements, a sound judgment which takes the measure of things as they are, and which goes shortest and most natural paths without wandering into meaningless refinements and subtleties. The diplomatist must be quick, resourceful, a good listener, courteous and agreeable, he should not seek to gain a reputation as a wit, nor should he be so disputatious as to divulge secret information in order to clinch an argument. Above all, the good negotiator must possess enough self-control to resist the longing to speak before he has thought out what he intends to say. He should pay attention to women but never lose his heart. He must be able to stimulate dignity even if he does not possess it, but it must at the same time, sorry, but he must at the same time avoid all tasteless displays. Courage also is an essential quality. Since no timid mind can hope to bring a confidential negotiation to success, the negotiator must possess the patience of a watchmaker and be devoid of personal prejudices. He must have a calm nature, be able to suffer fools gladly, and should not be given to drink, gambling, women, irritability, or any other wayward humors and fantasies. The negotiator, moreover, should study history and memoirs, be acquainted with foreign institutions and habits, and be able to tell where in any foreign country the real sovereignty lies. Everyone who enters the profession of diplomacy should know German, Italian, and Spanish languages, as well as Latin, ignorance of which would be a disgrace and shame to any public man since it is the common language of all Christian nations. 
He should also have some knowledge of literature, science, mathematics, and law. Finally, he should entertain handsomely. A good cook is often an excellent conciliator. The persona described in the foregoing detail is that official otherwise referred to as a diplomat chosen by a government to represent the country with other governments. Now, if the diplomat is described in the manner that has just been explained, is he different from the diplomatist? Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, one dictionary meaning of diplomatist is, quote, a foreign officer employee officially engaged as a diplomat, a person who is astute and tact tactful in any negotiation or relationship, unquote. We derive from the Latin origins of diplomaticus, the stem diplomat, explained as pertaining to official or original documents, tests, or charters. From there, apparently, diplomatists evolved to become understood as pertaining to international relations. Diplomatist, in the general sense, means tactful and adroit, skilled in negotiation or intercourse of any kind. My contention going forward, therefore, is that diplomat and diplomatist are arguably interchangeable. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my ultimate takeaway after reading this delightful book is that one, the late Ambassador Kwesin Saki was indeed made to become a diplomatist. Two, by inference, there is a positive message that even in our day, other diplomatists can be made. And three, that the life story of the late ambassador can or rather should be a source of inspiration to Ghana and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration to consciously cultivate modern day and future diplomatists. For that to happen, however, three conditions would be required in my view, as we learn from the practical and daily experiences of our celebrated ambassador. These conditions must find fulfillment first at the level of the individual, as the would-be diplomatist. Second, at the institutional level, that is at the level of the institution responsible for the making of a diplomatist. And finally, at the national stroke political level, where ultimate executive power is wielded and from where instructions are issued for the execution of the foreign policy of the country. Let us review in turn the status of these conditions at the three levels, starting at the individual level. We are repeatedly reminded in the book that our celebrated ambassador wanted to be a politician. He drove himself hard to achieve that goal through assiduous studies, membership of relevant groups during secondary and university days, exemplary leadership roles during his tenure as senior prefect at Infantrim School or during his interactions with members of the West African Students Union at Oxford, especially when he served as president. He displayed a constant readiness to allow himself to become conversant with developments in the wider world. In this connection, I empathize with Empire's palpable joy during his recollection on page 52 as follows. Quote, the year 1948 was altogether a very exciting and eventful year for me. 
I had obtained the highest educational qualification available in any institution in my country at the time. I had mastered the typewriter as a typist. Then I obtained the Secretary of State's scholarship to go to Exeter College, Oxford, to read politics, philosophy, and economics. And to crown it all, my parents engaged Miss Elsie Blankson for me to marry on December 18, 1948, which was also her birthday, unquote. In his detailed narration of his life and times during his Oxford days, Ambassador Kwesin Saki, the Gold Coaster, was always imbued with a deep awareness that there was a new awakening and that he had no doubt that he had a vital contribution to make after his studies in the building of a new nation where there would be prosperity, unity, and peace. It should also be noted that for nearly three years, Mpa acted as a labor officer, and that during this period, he interacted practically with workers, union organizations, management of the extractive industries based especially in and around Takwa, as well as the leadership in charge of labor matters at the local level. He accompanied his official duties with carrying out the accessory role as a part-time lecturer for the People's Education Association. In this capacity, he attempted to impart useful lessons to workers in the industrial, mining, and timber areas of the Tapa district. In reverse, he himself learned a lot about the aspirations of workers and the growing anxieties of employers and entrepreneurs. In this process, he learned the art of diplomacy. And in his dealings with workers and employers, came to have a full appreciation of the human nature. It is pertinent to conclude on this phase of the life of the ambassador with the following, quote, it had been my plan that I would plunge into active politics after five years of stay at the Labor Department, but this did not materialize. For now, I had been chosen for training as a diplomatist when I would study the art and science of diplomacy and practice as well." Unquote. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, having exhausted the discussion of the first out of the three conditions we established previously for there to be the successful making of a diplomatist, namely the development of oneself to the point of achieving eligibility as a potential diplomatist, let us consider the second condition by examining the role of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the makings of a diplomatist during the era of Empire and his peers. The ingredients for that condition to be established took the following forms. First, there was an articulation of the recruitment policy to be observed in strict detail as follows. Recruits were to be graduates from a recognized university and must have served for at least three years in the civil service. The next process was the elaboration of a structured training program with the following components. Six weeks of intensive course of lectures and seminars at the British Foreign Office and the Commonwealth Relations Office. One academic year of postgraduate studies in international relations and international law at the London School of Economics. A six months attachment at the British Embassy. A three to four months course in French language at Tours in France. At the end of it all, there was to be an examination to determine the grade of each officer, which would also take into consideration reports on the officers 
from the Foreign Office in London. The process led to the selection of Umpa together with seven others, namely Richard Maximilian Akwe, currently aged 99 and living at cantonments, Accra, recruited as an Oxford trained graduate in philosophy, politics, and economics. Late Henry Harry Reginald Amonu, history graduate from University of Ghana. Late Frank Edmund Boateng, a graduate in history from University of Ghana who reminded everybody that his surname did not carry the letter G at the end. Late Kenneth Kwekus Namandazi, a graduate in economics from Cambridge, Ebenezer Moses Deborah, aged 94, of Accra and Koforidua, as he likes to refer to himself. He was recruited as a graduate in history from the University of Ghana. The late Frederick Siegfried Arkus, a graduate, a graduate in economics from Aberdeen University, and late Abraham Benjamin Barkofi, a graduate in geography from the University of Southampton. Perhaps it is useful to recollect that the wives of the selected recruits were themselves giving officially sanctioned roles to play in support of the work and duties to be performed by their husbands. In the case of Mrs. Elsie Gwesensaki, her activities undertaken in that context in Brazil are given prominent treatment from pages 129 onwards. Umpa's memoirs make it clear that seven, seven cadets left Accra in August 1955 for the Foreign Office in London for the start of their training, and that two others joined them directly to take the number to nine, namely the late Frederick Siegfried Alkest, who had been undergoing a training course in mass communication in the United States under the auspices of the United States Information Services, and the late Henry Van Hinsechi, who read classics at King's College, Cambridge. In the case of the latter, while he did not have a previous work experience in the civil service, his pre-Cambridge academic record presumably won him the credits required for his eligibility. Indeed, it is documented that the late Ambassador Henry Van Hinsechi was privately tutored at home and sent at age eight and a half to then St. Nicholas Grammar School, currently at the Saddle College, where he took his own level, then known as Senior Cambridge, and subsequently entered the University of Gold Coast in 1950 to study classics. In 1953, he obtained his BA degree in classics with first class honors. Going by the account of Ambassador Kuisinsaki, we have nine cadet trainees. However, information from elsewhere has led some of us to conclude that there was a tenth recruit in the person of the late Kweku Bapui Asante, aka KB Asante, a voice from afar fame. His name was therefore included by members of the planning committee when it organized the award ceremony for the group of 10 pioneers of the foreign ministry, as previously alluded to. The members of the planning committee relied on the information available to it at the time, which today was confirmed by Ambassador Kwe, that KB Asante, who took a degree in mathematics at Durham University in England, was indeed selected in 1955 as a trainee career diplomat. 
But let us, at this stage, refer to the memoirs under review and observe that the training program mounted for the selected Gold Coasters covered other trainees from Pakistan and India, and that the scope and breadth of the training scheme constituted the next fulfillment in the path towards the makings of the late Ambassador Kwesin Saki as a diplomatist. That brings us to the third condition required, in my view, to become a diplomatist. Ambassador Gampo, yes. a message greeting me from the Bukopiba first test. If you end up telling the whole story, you will not give me $10,000. If? If you end up telling the whole story, you will not give me $10,000. So please, you are standing between $10,000 here. <laughs> It's your fault today. If you want to tell the whole story, you will lose money. It's your fault today. Okay. Well, with that interjection, uh, let, 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 let me... Let... Mr. Chairman, what say you? Shall we have the story? Yes. Okay, okay. So, 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 so let me, let me conclude. I thought I would at least uh, touch on the intricacies that led to his appointment as the first black president of the General Assembly. But uh, permit me as I bring my review to an end <laughs> to present some technical features about the book. In doing so, I will not venture to follow the example of one professor who I heard recently as he reviewed a book. This professor commented about the quality of the paper used to print the book. In my case, I simply would like to offer a well-intentioned observation, with, with, with no offense meant that we should settle on a final version of the title of the memoirs. While the copy I received to review carries the title, quote, the makings of a diplomatist with an S at the end of makings. I thought I noticed that on the program for today's launch, reference is rather made to the making of a diplomatist, but maybe I didn't see correct. I didn't see correctly. <laughs> the memoirs printed by Digibooks in hardcover are two ninety-four pages long, with an assortment of additional inputs that offer further revealing insights into the life and times of our eminent diplomatist, covering especially such areas as biography from the UN archives, and so on. After reading through the memoirs, I became even more comforted in my long-held view that not every Tom, Dick, and Harry qualified to become a diplomatist, stroke diplomat, stroke ambassador, stroke foreign service officer. In this sense, the creeping practice of populating Ghana's diplomatic service with officials with no prior and adequate training to perform as such should cease. And for more insights in this subject, I refer you to the piece written by the late KB Asante in the Daily Graphic entitled, quote, Who Qualifies to Be an Ambassador? Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, while thanking the late KB Asante for giving us that seminal piece on who qualifies as an ambassador as far back as 2009, I wholeheartedly welcome the timely publication of the makings of a diplomatist 
As previously observed, the book is an excellent piece of work, momentous in character, historic in detail, and priceless with respect to the information it contains. In that context, it offers a comprehensive blueprint for the task ahead of restoring glory, excellence, and professionalism to Ghana through the effective utilization of her diplomatic, ma diplomatic machinery, which is losing its luster. I thank you for you. And for your opening. And so for your penetrating observations, insightful reading, and raising very pertinent questions and theories about diplomacy from your viewpoint and that of our father, we, his sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, say thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Bradford. <clears throat> I still, I only have $6,000 left. No problem. <laughs> what unites a people? Stories, as simple as that. And telling us a very compelling story about our father is a writer, director, producer, a man who's acclaimed as the storyteller of all time, ladies and gentlemen, has brought glory to our nation and given him that pride of place in history. Would you please make welcome the venerable Cole and Sam. Yes, one case. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I can. Uh, okay, if you can. It is painful somehow that there was no YouTube, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and other social media platforms back in the middle 60s. I would have made a post of some three persons at lunch in the United Nations VIP restaurant and simply asked people to recognize who and who was in that picture and share. I'm sure the post, as they say these days, would have gone viral. The three persons, distinguished guests, I'm referring to were myself, the aff affable Uncle Alex, affectionately called Mpa, whose memories we are about to formally launch today. And listen carefully. That third person was Marlon Brando. <laughs> wow. Even as President of the United Nations General Assembly and the first black African at that, Uncle Alex didn't have any airs about himself. He treated everyone with all the politeness at his command. There I was, an ordinary performing arts student from Ghana, sitting next to Marlon Brando. I mean, uh, I was used to the watches and the <laughs> bankum and floor. And they ordered something called espargot de bonbon, I don't know. <laughs> And here I was in sort of enjoying my food. I was staring at Marlon. I, enjoy, I was enjoying staring at Marlon more than the food. <laughs> Mpa had wanted to impress me with. But I mean, he couldn't have done more inviting me to lunch to meet such a great man 
God has created as an actor to walk this earth of us. Emperor Alex just wanted to tell me that um, if I took whatever I was doing seriously, I can eat with anybody. And talking, referring to the parents, Ghanaian parents, say, Afrova Ukun and Samu here. No, I didn't pay him for what did he? Honestly, Empire would always enjoy inviting students, telling us to stay away from the vices that would drive us into very disgraceful things that will not keep Africa's name up there. What we can overlook was that Empire was as human as all of us, and he couldn't have claimed to be perfect. But he stood among his peers, contemporaries, and always stood tall. His advice to us impact most of us who have today turned out to be somebody. If I call myself somebody today, even though I'm nobody, I always remember the affection of empire as an African leader. It made us proud one day, and he would always send the messages that will make Africa, our African students proud. One day, Mpa calls us and tells us that one, Techumensen, Techumensen, the first African black sea, uh, ship captain was coming to Brunswick, New York. We all ran to New York Empire himself was there to meet him. An ambassador, some ambassadors today would say, I am His Excellency, and I would not be there. Empire was there to make him feel that Ghana existed in the United States. And unfortunately for us Ghanaian students, when we got there, the African American just lifted the giant Teaching Manson up there and told us to get away. He didn't belong to us. <laughs> How would you feel? As a Ghanaian at that time, seeing the first African president, a, a, a ship captain, I mean, we were driven away. And it makes you feel so good that even outside that the people in the diaspora seem to have been affected. And uh, the impact was so great, we all felt proud. Nkrumah was in Ghana, and powers at the United Nations, and made us feel that we must all stand firm, study well, go back home, and continue with the story. Here we are. I've told my story. Thank you. The legendary comments, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. <clears throat> There's nothing like the power of a story. Thank you for telling yours with such conviction. We're grateful. If our father were to reincarnate, hmm, his new name will be Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas. Moba, like him, ladies and gentlemen, this is a man who is a Ghanaian lawyer, diplomat, politician, and academic who served as an international civil servant since 2002. 
He last served as the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General for West Africa and the Sahel and the former head of UNOWAS from April 2014 to April 2021. Previously, he served as the UNSRSG and head of the joint UNAU peacekeeping mission in the fall 2012 to 2014, the Secretary General of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific Group of States 2010 to 2012, and the President of the Economic Community of West African States 2006 to 2009. The beautiful thing about his journey is that, ladies and gentlemen, like our father, he happens to be the longest serving deputy foreign affairs minister of the Republic. But please, a round of applause. His is a little colored because he became MP, was a civil war mediator, became deputy minister for education, he returned to parliament and well found it too hot, and so ventured out to ECOWAS, to the United Nations, and today, ladies and gentlemen, he is the chair of the ECOWAS Trade Liberalization Scheme Tax Force and working on the Abidjan-Lagos Corridor to remove all trade barriers. With a profile as long as Nigeria's next attempt to the World Cup, please welcome His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Elitan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will also stand on the protocols already established while, of course, acknowledging the Ghana Council Foreign Relations and the Kwesisaki family for uh, bringing us together for this important lunch uh, today. Um, I, I gladly accepted to be the special guest of honor at today's book launch for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, His Excellency Alexander Kwesinsaki was a distinguished foreign minister of Ghana and the first African to serve as the president of the United Nations General Assembly, making him an African trailblazer in international diplomacy for many of us to follow in later years. He was a pioneer who projected the African personality on the international scene and demonstrated that if given equal opportunity, Africans could perform creditably just as well as others. And I think uh, our uncle, Uncle Echo, has uh, given us some uh, snippets uh, of uh, this great uh, African personality and how he represented us with dignity uh, on the international scene. The second reason, of course, is the Infancipim, the mobile connection, which both ambassadors Ose and Cabral invoked when they called to ask me to take up uh, this role uh, today. His Excellency, was an, a proud old boy of the school, as we have been told, being of the class of 1945. And as we were taught at Infanspim, Bibia Mpeifum, to wit, there are seniors in any human context with the implication that they must be acknowledged and respected. And I'm here today precisely to do so, to play due respect to a very senior old boy. He was at the height of his diplomatic career as foreign minister of Ghana during our early years at Infancement. He was a household name in Ghana because of his highly successful career at the UN in New York and was a huge source of pride and inspiration to students all across the country, certainly students of my generation. As a matter of fact, two of my direct classmates, uh, we've been told by Awo, Eja, and Nana, were his sons who had joined us in Form 1. And I can identify at least two of my classmates here. There may be more. You have to excuse me. I see Texan, and I see Ambassador Hayford. If there are others that I haven't seen, um, forgive me. These are the two that I... I can, uh, I think that we are the only two who are here today for this uh, important event. 
and they were coming straight from New York. Both of them became personal friends um, through to our university days, and again when we all lived in the U.S. in the 70s and 80s. It is also in honor of their memory that I'm participating in today's book lunch. There's yet another reason. My brother and very good friend, the late lawyer Boniface Kobina, became a member of the Kwesinsaki family when he had a son, Awinate Kobina, uh, with our sister Awo. And Awo tells us that Awinate has always been encouraging of her projects, including, I'm setting this one. Awo, so I think you understand what I meant by my many bondings with the Kwesinsaki family when I told you that I'll be here uh, with a lot of pride and satisfaction. Well done for pulling this together and bringing us together for this important launch. My brother and junior old boy, <laughs> Ambassador Wig Bramful has uh, characteristically uh, made a brilliant review of the book. And as he got up to come and decay, observe the booklet he was holding, uh, he whispered to me, oh my God, the, the, the doctor is in his element today. <laughs> and, and I said, he's, he's only making my task simpler. <laughs> so um, I, I only, only wish to make a few observations or reflections at this point. One, the caliber of the foreign service officers or civil service personnel in general at the time, which has been uh, elaborated upon very deeply in the review. It is evident that the basis of recruitment into the civil service as a whole was merit and not connections, protocol or po party politi uh, political party list. The nine or 10 who were the nucleus of the new foreign service at independent Ghana were of high caliber Ex with excellent qualifications and committed to public service. We're told about the rigorous process that these faithful 10 went through. The best in class were inducted into the National Foreign Service. The training was especially tough. And according to Alex Kwesinsaki, I quote, the training was indeed as intensive as it was comprehensive covering every facet of foreign policy and diplomatic methods. It is not surprising, therefore, that soon after independence, Ghana was highly successful in making an impact on the international scene. Not only did Ghana have a dynamic and visionary leader in Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, but it also possessed capable and well-trained diplomatists who suffered no deficit no complex in their intellectual and professional capacities. The author himself tells us that throughout my diplomatic career, I tried to maintain high standards in my dealings. This not only served him well, but propelled him to become the first African to be elected president of the UN General Assembly, but it gave Ghana also a crop of diplomats who had the skills knowledge and confidence to provide leadership to Africa on many topical issues of the times on the international scene. Two, if I can reflect on Ghana, the UN. Ghana used the platform provided by the UN to push for the decolonization of the rest of Africa. And Alex Wisinsaki and his colleagues were in the vanguard in mobilizing the Afro-Asian and Latin American delegations at the UN to support the passage of, for instance, the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples. This set the tone for the fight for independence, the liberation struggles, and the anti-apartheid struggles on the African continent. The rest, they say, is history. My third point, which I term, the more things change, the more they say the same. 
is this that I found it fascinating, indeed intriguing, that 60 Yeti is still grappling with many of the challenges it faced at the time Kwezisaki was active at the UN in New York. Of course, I'm not oblivious to the fact that we face new threats today, peculiar to our times such as cybercrime, cybersecurity, the climate crisis, international terrorism, health pandemic such as the recent COVID-19, which practically brought the world to a standstill, the challenge of deepening regional and sub-regional integration, etc. But the principal issues that were the raison d'etre for the founding of the UN have remained with us, namely threat to global peace and security on the one hand and on the other, the, develop, the underdevelopment, poverty, and huge gaps between haves and have-nots, which more often than not are the root causes of instability and crisis globally. In that regard, I wish to refer to the following global challenges of today. A, the ongoing war in Ukraine, a European ethnic tribal conflict which, if not handled properly, has a real prospect of triggering a nuclear war with potentially disastrous consequences for human life as we know it today. We must not be oblivious of the fact that two previous world wars was a result of the failure of Europeans, European powers, to resolve their differences among themselves. Incidentally, exactly 60 years ago, in, 20, in, in 1962, as we are faced with a nuclear threat today in 2022, Alex Kwesisaki takes us through the harrowing experience of the Cuban Missile Crisis. He recounts the intense moments they lived at the UN headquarters, feverishly mediating between the US and the then USSR to avert confrontation and nuclear conflagration. War is never the answer. It is our expectation that common sense will prevail Dialogue and negotiations with Churchill called Jojo will be given priority to save mankind from nuclear annihilation if the Ukraine-Russia conflict spins out of control. B, and here I want to talk about Congo, which is still in turmoil. As in the 1960s, and a lot is referred to in the book on Congo, today, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a key item on the agenda of the UN Security Council. This is the same crisis that caused the life of the indefatigable and much admired UN Secretary General Doug Hamishaw. A number of UN peacekeepers and several Congolese civilians have in recent weeks lost their lives in attacks on the UN mission in Congo, MONUSCO. The tremendous natural resources of the DRC remain a curse to the country as a conspiracy of foreign interests and domestic shortcomings combine to prevent the country from realizing its full potential. Patrice Lumumba was greatly admired by uh, Kwesisaki uh, was indeed hosted by him at his residence in New Rochelle, where I believe he spent a night or two. Lumumba, as we know, was cut down brutally by foreign hide agents who have never faced justice. His vision for his country was extinguished, and events there have since turned out to be a continuing nightmare for Congo and the African continent. Only last week, a UN spokesperson to MONUSCO was declared persona non grata. Plus ça change? Merci. C, the development agenda remains stalled. We are told in the book that the 1960s was declared 
the development decade, 1960s, development decade. 60 years later, this decade, the 2020s, is the final decade for attaining the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs 2015-2030, aimed at halving poverty by 50% in the developing countries. Though a laudable objective, this is now unlikely to be attained as we are lagging behind in most, if not all, of the 17 objectives. On goal one, for example, it has now been established the world will miss the target by 2030. The UN report on the SDGs for 2021 projects that by 2030, global poverty rates will be at 7%. That is about 600 million people, meaning that the vision to eradicate poverty would have been missed. In spite of the efforts of global partners, poverty, especially as measured by the absolute number of poor people, was already increasing in certain parts of the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated this trend. In 2020 alone, up to 124 million more people fell below the poverty line. Similar trends can be seen on goal two, focused on ending hunger. Close to a billion people faced hunger in 2020, an increase of 116 million from 2019, while the prevalence of undernourishment increased from 8.4% in 2019 to nearly 10% in 2020. In addition, inequality is widening both between countries North and South in particular, and within countries. According to the World Inequality Report, released by the World Inequality Laboratory in 2021, the richest 10% of the global population currently take home 52% of the incomes, while the poorest 10% earn just 8%. In fact, the report indicated that the poorest half of the global population owns just 2% of the total wealth, while the richest 10% controls 76% of global wealth. Perhaps Ghana illustrates best within country disparities on SDGs progress and inequality. By 2015, when the final Millennium Development Goals MDGs report was issued, Ghana was said to have achieved the target of halving poverty, the poverty rate ahead of schedule from 51% in 1999 to 24% in 2006. However, regarding progress towards SDGs, the northern part of the country remains behind in most of the indicators, cite that by 2018, the Ghana Statistical Service reported that while the poverty rate in, for instance, greater Accra region was 2.5%, it was 61.1% in Northern region, 54.8% in Upper East, and 70.9% in Upper West region. The recently released multi-dimensional poverty profile of Ghana shows a similar picture. This clearly indicates that the SDG's goal of leaving no one behind is far from being on track. A whole lot of people are being left behind. D, stalled UN reform. Another issue which was on the international agenda and remained unresolved has been the reform of the UN itself, but especially the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council is the powerhouse of the organization, we're told in the book, and its reform has stalled since its membership was enlarged from 11 to 15 
at the time of His Excellency Kwesin Saki. That's when the membership of the council moved from 11 to 15, adding non -permanent, more non-permanent members. It remains very much a reflection of the world power structure in the immediate post-Second World War world. New dynamics in the global political and economic realities, which reflect a multipolar uh, multi world, are not accommodated in the UN Security Council, as old world powers cling on to their past glories. Emerging powers, such as Brazil, India, Indonesia, to mention but a few, and the entire African continent continue to demand permanent seats at the Security Council to no avail. So far, technicalities have been used to block any concrete moves for reform. The irony here is that some of our partners and friends, advocates of democracy, see no contradiction in the lack of democracy inherent in the excessive power they wield on the Security Council, totally out of proportion with their real weight today. Fourth observation. After reading the book, one realizes that the basic essentials of Ghana foreign policy have remained largely unchanged. Ghana has always been conscious of her status as the first sub-Saharan country to gain independence. This brought with it a responsibility to lead, to champion the cause of independence for other countries, to fight against racism and racial discrimination, which is rife today, to exude African personality, African dignity, and to advocate for African unity through inter-African cooperation and integration. The basic essentials of the foreign policy also include what Kwesin Saki called, quote, the supreme objectives to preserve Ghana's permanent interest, that is, protecting our territorial integrity, building stable, peaceful, and prosperous relations with others, and giving every Ghanaian the right to education, shelter, food, and clothing, end of quote. Our foreign policy objectives also included adhesion to existing organizations such as the UN, the Non-Aligned Movement, the OAU, and respect for our international obligations. Very prominent on our foreign policy objectives are continental and regional and sub-regional integration and trade and economic diplomacy. Kwesi Saki tells us that from the beginnings of our nationhood, Ghana was determined not to be, quote, embroiled in great power politics, but ought to add her small voice to all those countries advocating peace. This was the rationale for our policy of non-alignment during the Cold War period. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, many were quick to announce the irrelevance of the policy of non-alignment. But today, in the wake of the Ukraine crisis and the growing tensions between, in particular, the US and China, and anybody tuning their TVs will see the brinksmanship going around on now in the, uh, the South China Sea, across the Straits of Taiwan. On the other hand, the U.S. and Russia have been at, again, uh, pulling left and right. So maybe it was premature to consider the non-aligned movement dead. If even it died, perhaps it ought to be resurrected. For let us remember the old African wise saying that when two elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. And already you can see that we are in the midst of the pull and push, uh, everybody asking us to take their sides, and we simply want to be left alone to manage our business, to grow our economies, fight poverty, be friends to all. Ghana has always insisted that it wanted to be friends to all and enemy to none. That has been in our nature 
I should say, our DNA as Ghanaians. We prefer to work with all nations to build a stable, peaceful world. We prefer to be friends to all that respect our independence, our African personality and dignity, and shows mutual respect for us. We welcome all countries that are willing to support us to overcome historical handicaps, such as the structural global inequalities, which exist up to today. Help us fighting poverty and deprivation. Of course, that involves building strong, accountable, democratic institutions, empowering youth and women, preserving the environment for a sustainable future. It also calls for fair trade and transformation of our economy from its essentially raw materials extraction mode into one that involves industrialization, value addition, job creation, technology development. In conclusion, before my brother uh, Kofi Bagna changes his mind, I think I should, I should wind down. Eh? We still want him to buy that, uh, eh? be the first to be. Eh? Kofi, we are watching you. <laughs> in conclusion, let me join us all in welcoming the launch of this book, which gives us a rich historical perspective of the foundations, the groundings of Ghana's foreign policy. It should serve as a useful guide to foreign policy makers and practitioners in these times of global turmoil on how best to preserve the secret traditions of Ghanaian foreign policy and the supreme interest of the country in the face of mounting pressure from several powerful quarters. It is also a study in how an African diplomat with courage, knowledge, and conviction held himself at highest level in advocacy for the cause of his country and that of Africa. I highly recommend the book to diplomats, scholars, researchers, students, indeed, to all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency, Dr. Mohamed Ibn Chambas. And so now is the moment we've all been waiting for, where we officially unveil the book to you and declare it formally known. I guess the owner, on the hands of the high table, will be outstanding. Officially, our door to us. <laughs> and so to go and give glory, ladies and gentlemen, this day is going to us the meetings of our diplomacy. The memoirs of our father, Ambassador Alex, please accept me.
is not just a book, it's a statement of what we all did. Excellence in the pursuit of it. We're telling a story of a man whose life is worth a legacy. As we preach and will continue to be preach a legacy to prosperity. What you're going to do is not just buy a book, you're going to make a statement. And so I believe the first statement has been made, ten thousand dollars, that we accept that as the going price. In the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I told the pastor that she's not giving dollars, she's giving seeds. And so I just asked, how much do you think? Five thousand. Ten thousand seeds. Okay, 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 okay. So the good for you, Pastor, says we should start from ten thousand dollars. Do we have fifteen? Or 15 is just starting to 20, you know, you fair amount. If you talk, we are listening to government. I was going to be listening to government. We are listening to government. I was like, oh yeah, please, talk to us. Tell us. Shall we do 10,000? 10,000. Ladies and gentlemen, the people will be back now. Long of those 10,000 times a week. And so, in the spirit of the first fire for this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you please raise your hand wherever you are, and I'll come to you. I'll do rule service if that's what you want. 10,000 dollars is you need 10 people to make the statement of the measure of the man. 10,000 dollars is. Where some people are saying, Oh, yes, sir, I see a hand there. Please. Thank you very much. May yeah, I do your name, sir? His voice is for nobody. We understand. Thank you very much. And for my 10,000 Ghana series, we just have 10 people or 10 books for that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You can look from here, please. I'm not glancing, let me show. Let, let, let me say like, you know, the, the back page is to, let me show up. See, if I'm not going to show up, I'll be there. See, that's the actual thing. Ten thousand years it is. Ten thousand years We want the whole world to know that once in Ghana, we show the way, and we continue to show the way. 10,000 Ghana cities, this is a story that must be told to millions yet from born, and it starts with you and I. 10,000 Ghana cities. Okay, since we are listening to Mr. Chairman, what say you? Shall we do somewhere between seven to 10,000? Number four. Or five. Okay, so five to ten thousand. Any way you think that we need to do. Please. When the word of the Lord comes to you, have not your heart. Please. Five thousand to ten thousand. Yes, I see a hand here. Thank you very, very much. Oh. That's what sisters are for, ladies and gentlemen. We're grateful to you, our sister and our friend. Five thousand Ghana cities. Five thousand. I see a lot of happy ones here. But don't worry, we're not no please shut on the camera. They don't want their faces to show. They don't want their eyes to know their faces. I have five minutes to do this. Please, five thousand years. Who be the next? Who be the next? For those who are feeling 
Can we do 2,000 plus 2,000, please? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Please. That is there. 2,000, yes, I see you on the back. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan is at 3,000, yes. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you for thank you very much.
and this is how far the Lord has brought us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for this great show of love and support in celebration of our father, our grandfather, our friend, and our all. Indeed, it is said that the Lord gave the word, but great was the company that published it. Clearly, you have shown that you are men and women whom we can depend on as family. It now falls to Nengi Kwesensaki, the fifth child of her father, and who was born in New York when Dr. Saki was serving as Ghana's ambassador to the United Nations, to render thanks and close us in prayer. A round of applause as it comes. Um, just one brief announcement. Tomorrow, on Sunday morning, rather, there will be a Thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord for what he has done. Having said that, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your support. After reading that, I finally sat down and was from beginning to end. I read the book. So thank you for the book. I hope you enjoy the reading. Um, just don't look at the picture of me as a baby. I want to thank the panel here, Ambassadors, DKOSA, Ambassador Dr. Tandas, Ambassador Rick Bravo, Ambassador Cabral, I'm here, Uncle Kwanson, my sister Abu. I want to thank the Ricky Bucky Choir for the wonderful music. I've always enjoyed their music. And, uh, this we can all thank you, everyone. I'm not going to talk for long, I'm just going to pray now. So let's uh, position ourselves for prayer. I just learned that from the song. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together to celebrate the life of a great statesman and to the masses today. We thank you and pray for blessings upon all those who have made this event possible. Having given us examples of good diplomacy in the life of your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ, we ask that you help us to stay consistently in your word and faith, that we might abide in you and you in us. We pray that the contents of this book, along with the writings of your sacred book, serve as a guide in the makings of future diplomatists as well as the improvements of our current ones. Please help us not to get swept up in the things of this world. Help us to keep our minds focused on you and may we strive to do your will. We pray that grant each and every one here assembled a safe passage to our various destinations. And we thank you, Lord God, for your compassion and kindness towards us. And we say this prayer in the name of your loving Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We will sing one verse of the Matthew Spirit and do it the right way. Stand in. Oh, only Mobile will stand, the river will stand. Only Mobile will stand.
Come, the heavens. The Lord has given to me. The Lord has his faith to shine upon you in this business of you. May the Lord give the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Let's go. 